While I was opening this package, I couldn't help but think of how Intel, after developing the Shadowbridge architecture, got so lazy that we had to wait 6 whole years for significant improvement in the mainstream CPU market. What exactly lies inside this mildly beat up cardboard box that made me think of the above disturbing thought is the main topic of this video, that both my YouTube partner and I spent a lot of time and effort to create and present to you as well as we could, so we really hope you enjoy every minute of it. The story begins in Las Vegas. It is January 5th, 2011 when Intel CEO Paolo Delini officially presented at CES press conference the second-generation Intel Core family, codenamed Sandy Bridge. Based on the solid foundation of the Helm and Westmere design, Intel's new architecture blew AMD out of the water on server, desktop and laptop market and sealed Intel's total dominance for many years to come. Intel's ability to manufacture much better chips than AMD in terms of performance and efficiency, allowed Intel to focus on its own plan instead of following AMD in the race for more cores. Intel's main strategy was based on the TikTok production model, where every tick represented a shrinking of the lithography process and every talk represented the designing of an improved microarchitecture. Sandy Bridge was the talk on Intel's production cycle which successfully placed them well ahead of AMD. That put AMD under immense pressure, pushing them to make big changes on their own microarchitecture design. Knowing already that they couldn't compete Intel on a single-threaded performance, they decided to trade instructions per cycle for higher frequency and more cores. Of course, as we all know now, this strategy didn't pay off. The bulldozer architecture was one of AMD's most disappointing products. It bulldozed AMD's plans for the next six years while granted Intel Sandy Bridge a very bright and prosperous future. Eleven years later, we are going to revisit the top Sandy Bridge main street processor the Intel Core i7-2700K. Before our hero stepped into the benchmarking arena, I had to boost a bit its confidence. I didn't see the point to hold an unlocked processor at stock speed. On the other hand, I didn't want to push the old charm too hard. So, with the help of ASUS P8Z68 Deluxe Edition and a 240 AIO cooler, I achieved an effortless 4.7 GHz overclock. If you want to know more about the rest of the hardware and software that accompany the Intel i7-2700K, check the specification list in the description below. The journey began with few synthetic benchmarks and more specific with a very well-known Cinebench. While keeping one eye on the past and one on the present, I ran the Cinebench R11.5 as well as the latest R23 version. Evaluating both the single and multi-core performance of the i7-2700K, the old R11.5 version record 1.89 points for the single core and 9.08 points for the multi-core test. These numbers are somewhat similar to an Intel Core i7-4790. The latest R23 version gave 905 single core and 45,002 multi core score, reaching almost the same levels of the AMD Ryzen 7 1700. Another popular synthetic benchmark is 3D Mark. Since we care only about the CPU performance, I focus solely on physics tests. The old 3D Mark 11 at 1080 resolution scenes scored 96,029 points. The demo version of 3D Mark Firestrike locked at 1080 gave 11,588 points and the more demanding Time Spy at 1440p physics test reached the 39,054 points, a performance almost identical to a Ryzen 5 1600 Zen architecture. Unfortunately, the above results are comparable only with the benchmarking suit itself and they don't correlate apples to apples with the actual gameplay experience. Considering that and the time when the i7-2700K was released to the market, I decided to play some old PC games to remember how good our CPU was back then. 
Although Metro 2033 it might appear to be antique, it can be quite demanding even on today's mainstream gaming computers. At 1080 and very high settings, we got an average 124 FPS. Frankly, not bad if you consider the fact that the RTX 2060 at times was bottlenecking the system, thus the 67 1% low. And that brought to the table the unavoidable and very crucial question. Can the Intel i7-2700K run Crisis? You see, back in 2007, Crisis offered an amazing open world that only very few computer parts could handle its full potential. That was enough to create a reputation that lasted more than a decade and as you are about to watch, rightfully so. At 1080 and very high settings, the FPS numbers were borderline decent. Even though the average frames are staying well above the mandatory 60 mark, there are occasions that the frame rate drops below that. Of course, both Metro 2033 and Crisis are not optimized to utilize all the cores and threads of i7-2700K and this excuses why our gaming rig had a rough time to maintain high frames at all moments. Thus, taking into account all the above, it will be more appropriate to test the i7-2700K with modern AAA titles that fully utilize each and every core in a processor unit. And Halo Infinite is definitely one of these games. While multiplayer battlegrounds might not be as demanding as campaign mode, it is intensive enough to stress your computer hardware. At 1080 low settings, both CPU and GPU were working at full capacity to produce an average at 73 frames per second. The 1% low at 43 frames was gameplay-wise just tolerable. So I dropped the resolution to absolute minimum to observe more or less the same pattern. That's the first sign that the i7-2700K will have a hard time handling such resource-hungry PC games. The picturesque benchmark of Forza Horizon 5 reflects the in-game performance very accurately, and the i7-2700K did quite well in this. At 1080 high settings, the 87 and 61 average and unpersonal low respectively offered a remarkable experience. In order to give GPU some slack, I dropped the resolution to 720 and played a bit with the game settings. That didn't change the CPU utilization much, so I had to take a look at the performance summary screen to see the obvious CPU bottleneck. Next on the list was Captain Bullhead. The high frame numbers while playing Hitman 3 at 1080 high settings might trick you that the i7-2700K can run the game without problem. Unfortunately, the truth is quite the opposite. Dartmoor is one of Hitman's three integrated benchmarks, which contains a lot of physics calculations capable of directing the gameplay workload on the CPU. Under this test, our processor barely kept the 1% low above the 60 FPS, and switching the simulation quality from base to best stressed the CPU even more, dropping the frames to 57 and 20 on average and 1% low respectively. Rift Breaker's CPU benchmark is an excellent tool to check out the strength of i7-2700K. At 1080 high settings, the end result shown on average 59 frames and the 1% low dropped to 15. With rendering GPU time 15.8 milliseconds and CPU time 40 milliseconds, the processor was one more time the Achilles heel of our system. Minecraft, besides being one of the most famous games of all times, can also be a handy CPU testing tool. Using the benchmark 3 map created by KingCake57, I managed to sync the average frame to 20 and the 1% low to 16. Obviously, Minecraft uses all the cores effectively, thus makes this a very interesting map to test your CPU's power. Keeping the same settings and creating a brand new world, the game ran at 53 and 31 frames on average and 1% low respectively. Finally, I couldn't omit from the benchmarking procedure one more well-known game. Fortnite can fully utilize both the CPU and the graphics card, the magnet of which is always determined by the selected settings. Using DirectX 12 at 1080 resolution and playing on Rumble mode, the i7-2700K with 152 average did a good job if you don't count, of course, the below 60 on 1% low. Switching to performance mode, we got more or less the same results. 
The light GPU workload is a strong indication of a CPU bottleneck and Fortnite during this period of time is very unoptimized thus the occasional FPS drops. Summarizing together all the above results, the once king of desktop CPUs shows clear signs of its age. Its raw power kept it relevant and managed to maintain it to life all these years, but this is not enough anymore. Some of the factors that undermine its core effectiveness are the absence of new instruction sets, the old PCI Express bus, the restricted memory bandwidth, and the use of the almost obsolete DDR3 RAM. If you are searching the used market for a cheap gaming rig, most likely there are younger CPUs and platforms to invest in. Anything similar or better to AMD's Zen R5 or Intel's 8th Gen Core i5 processors, it's a good example of that. As for the owners of an i7-2700K, they can pair it with the GTX 1070 or an RX 5500 XT and have satisfying gameplay at 1080 low to medium settings when playing some of today's and tomorrow's CPU intensive PC games. How long before Sandbridge becomes absolute obsolete to run modern gaming titles is only a matter of how fast Intel and AMD are willing to push the boundaries of the upcoming technologies and how fast the game developers are willing to adapt to while abolishing older instruction sets and totally disregarding older hardware. As we look back on 2011, Intel made a big leap forward and established its dominance with a Sandy Bridge architecture that offered a fresh set of AVEX instructions, big turbo boost, iGPU upgrades, and higher performance with better power efficiency at incredible lower prices compared to its predecessors. Since then, AMD's lack of competition led Intel team to rest on its laurels. Sandy Bridge was so successful that it became a staple through the next five generations of Intel processors. While Intel sat on its previous success, it forgot the importance of conceiving innovative ideas and creating evolutionary technologies. Intel's next-gen CPU improvements devolved from big to small to tiny. That gave AMD the opportunity to rise from the grave. In the year 2016, after six years of stagnation in the mainstream CPU market, AMD developed Zen architecture that finally could compete the legendary Intel Core i7-2600K and 2700K processors. And this was only the beginning of a huge change, which I could tell you more about it. But that is another story for another time. Until then, take care of yourself. Farewell, goodbye. See you in a while.